All right, good morning. Uh, I am Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, and today the committee is holding an oversight hearing on sustainability and resilience at New York City's wastewater treatment plants. And we are hearing two bills associated with wastewater treatment and air quality near wastewater treatment plants. Last year, a shipment of sewage sludge purported to be from New York City was stranded in Parrish, Alabama for months. Dubbed the poop train incident, uh, noxious odors from the cargo forced parish residents to shelter inside and led to a sustained backlash so severe that the company that operated the landfill to which the waste was heading was stripped of its business licenses. And various lawsuits have since put a halt to the practice of shipping biosolids to Alabama for landfilling purposes. Biosolids are the sewage sludge waste that remains after treatment and is either sent to landfill or further processed for use as a fertilizer or, soil, or for soil amendment. The Clean Water Act's biosolids rule establishes standards for the final use and or disposal of sewage sludge generated during the treatment of domestic sewage in a sewage treatment plant. Standards are included for sewage sludge applied to the land, placed on a surface disposal site, or fired in a sewage sludge incinerator. Also included are pathogen and alternative vector attraction reduction requirements for sewage sludge applied to the land or placed on a surface disposal site. However, concerns related to biosolids use are not strictly limited uh, to a factory realm. The Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, has identified hundreds of pollutants present in biosolids, including some acutely hazardous hazardous or priority pollutants, but EPA lacks the data or risk assessment tools to generally make a determination on the safety of biosolids. According to the EPA, pollutants found in biosolids include pharmaceutical products, steroids, and even flame retardants. Critics have pointed out, however, that many pathogens commonly found in human excrement that are likely capable of surviving biosolid processing such as hepatitis A virus, rotavirus, norovirus, and others are not tested for or regulated by the EPA. There have been a number of human and animal fatalities linked to the exposure to beneficially used biosolids. Wastewater treatment plants are also responsible for the emissions of greenhouse gases and the creation of ultrafine uh, bioaerosols tiny droplets of mist that can harbor any, many, any of the microorganisms commonly found in partially treated sewage. One study found that the presence of aerosolized uh, mesophilic bacteria and fecal coliform bacteria in petri dishes near a wastewater treatment plant. Nitrous oxide is also released during the nitrification and denitrification processes, while volatile organic compounds are released during the chemical treatment and composting digesting stages. Today we are hearing two bills involving wastewater treatment plants. Intro 984 would require that any person transforming, uh, transporting sewage sludge does so in a container enclosed by solid materials that prevent the emission of noxious odors. Intro 1165 would require an air quality monitoring program around wastewater treatment plants operated by DEP. The program would monitor hazardous air pollutants near the plants, including but not limited to greenhouse gases and airborne microorganisms. Wastewater treatment plants are an indispensable component of modern society, but neither sewage sludge nor air quality near wastewater treatment plant should degrade our quality of life. I know we're gonna hear from Councilmember Salamanca when he arrives. Um, so I will uh, put that on the record now. I know he's the co-sponsor of both these pieces of legislation. Uh, I want to recognize uh, that we have joining us from the committee, uh, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca from Brooklyn. Thank you for being here. Um, and at this point, we will take testimony uh, from the administration. And then after that testimony, we will, uh, I may interrupt you to have Raf uh, Councilmember Salamanca uh, come in as well. We are still going to vote on the two bills and one resolution, uh, 268A, 425, 424A, and then a resolution, 
um, at some point during this hearing today. Um, and if anyone is that excited, uh, no clapping, please. This is what we do here. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to the administration to be sworn in and take their testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. All you. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Constantinidis and members of the Committee on the Environmental Protection for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Pam Alardo. I am the Deputy Commissioner of the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment in the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm here to speak about DEP's ongoing sustainability and resiliency work at our newly named wastewater resource recovery facilities. This is not a superficial name change. It reflects a continuing transformation of our work from the basic handling and treatment of wastewater to really being stewards of sustainable resources, where we're focused on minimizing waste, enabling the circular economy, and embracing innovation. DEP has a long legacy of clean water action. This dates back to the 1890s with the construction of the first rudimentary wastewater treatment plant designed to protect farming and fishing in Brooklyn. The rapid population expansion of the city and the industrial growth through the early and mid 20th century meant that we needed additional wastewater treatment infrastructure. And the city started to address that with a number of facilities in the 1930s through the 1950s. And I'd, I'd just like to comment that this is really progressive uh, amongst uh, cities in the world to be ahead of the curve on building wastewater treatment infrastructure. And then with the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972, and along with modern environmental advocacy, the city began to invest heavily in water pollution control. And today, today, our waters are cleaner than they've been in 140 years. We see now healthy fisheries, oysters, wetlands, and even whales returning to our waters. Um, very exciting time for us. As you may know, DEP owns and operates one of the largest wastewater collection and treatment systems in the world. We have 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities, 96 pumping stations that convey stormwater and wastewater to treatment. Many of these facilities are necessarily constructed in low-lying areas. As much as our system is gravity-fed and, and also on waterfront locations so that we can efficiently release clean water into the environment, which is the final product of our treatment process. As a result, coastal flooding, storm surges, all of this poses a major risk to our infrastructure. So prior to Sandy, Storm Sandy, we had uh, already been studying the impacts of climate change on wastewater treatment facilities. And in 2013, our agency developed a citywide resiliency approach that established resilient, resilient design guidelines for all wastewater projects moving forward. Our, and then in our uh, NYC wastewater resiliency plan stipulates that all critical equipment must be protected to the 100-year base flood evaluation, plus an additional 32 inches to account for sea level rise. <clears throat> Following Sandy, we performed an inventory of at-risk assessments using climate-based approaches that not only considered how to protect these facilities damaged during Sandy, but also to look at those affected by similar storms. Our risk analysis determined that part of all of our wastewater resource recovery facilities and 60% of our pumping stations were at risk. This could incur over a billion dollars of damage in a single event, and repeated events could bring those damages to over $2 billion. So therefore, as a result, DEP established design standards for every new project under a program that evaluates each capital project for energy and greenhouse gas reduction, waste reduction, climate resiliency, environmental materials, and green infrastructure. This analysis ensures that every project is geared towards the lowest impact, best resilient approaches, and ensures high quality service for our ratepayers into the future. In order to address the risk of our facilities, DEP participates in, uh, in FEMA and New York State grant programs, and this totals uh, over, one, uh, over $340 million for resiliency upgrades. These grants have helped DEP avoid passing on these costs directly to our ratepayers. So these improvements differ from facility to facility. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. Generally, the types of resiliency upgrades include elevating flood proofing essential equipment, installing deployable flood barriers, creating backup power sources, sealing buildings, 
and repairing or replacing damaged conduits. The majority of the work is slated to be completed at the end of 2021. We approach resiliency as an essential component of sustainability under the One New York Plan for a Strong and Just City. The mayor pledged to dramatically reduce overall, green, overall greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050 and reduce emissions from city government operations by 35% by 2025. Emissions from water and wastewater treatment systems are responsible for nearly 20% of the city's overall emissions, the city government overall emissions, and wastewater treatment plants, uh, not surprisingly, account for about 90% of that. So DEP has been very active and we've achieved a 23% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions between the years 2006 and 2018. In fact, emissions have uh, been reduced every single year since 2008, and we're on track to meet the one NYC interim goal of 40% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Our success has been achieved by improving the efficiency of wastewater treatment, capturing beneficial use of biogas, which along with the, the increasing the production of biogas, which is a valuable renewable energy source, also significantly reduces carbon emissions. These actions also create offsets against energy that originates from, from, from traditional fossil fuel sources. It can create also financial benefits through marketable environmental credits. DEP is embarking on a comprehensive energy and carbon neutrality plan to reduce energy consumption all across through our agency through using opti um, operational optimization, completing facility upgrades, targeting capital investments, integrating energy conservation measures and capital planning, as well as purchasing more efficient vehicles. DEP, uh, we have demand side solutions for energy. This reduces energy consumption. And so what we invest in is more energy efficient equipment and train our staff to operate facilities more efficiently. Uh, more efficiently. Thereby, we're, we're reducing our energy needs. As an example, we've identified over 500 energy conservation measures across all our industrial systems. And we are in the process of integrating these energy conservation measures in our state of good repair plan. We also pursue supply side solutions where we target the suppliers of our energy to change to less carbon intensive energy sources. For example, DEP produces 3.6 billion cubic feet of green, of green energy rich anaerobic digester gas every year. And we beneficially use that gas for power and heating purposes on site. We also are incorporating New York City's food waste into digesters for additional biogas generation. DEP is actually becoming a national leader in this field, food waste to energy. And we're taking uh, steps even further. We've partnered with National Grid to construct a biogas conditioning system on site at Newtown Creek, which will send DEP's biogas generated from public wastewater and food waste back into residences and businesses in the area. This is actually providing a perfect example of a local circular economy. Um, there's another category, which I know this, this uh, body has a lot of interest in, uh, traditional renewable energy programs, such as solar, photovoltaic, hydroelectric, wind, um, geothermal, and other zero emission systems. For example, the largest solar installation of 1.3 megawatts on city-owned properties is a DEP wastewater resource uh, recovery facility on Staten Island. We will be installing more solar and other, at other facilities across the city. We've deployed also some small-scale wind turbines, and we are planning to install more as we continue to investigate the feasibility of installing larger-scale wind power. Hydropower, this is another example of our clean, clean power portfolio. While it also supports economic development in the host municipalities and generates revenue for New York City. In addition to the upcoming Cannonsville hydropower plant, DEP has already owned several hydropower facilities and we're studying the feasibility of building more full scale as well as micro and tidal systems. There's a one really good story is that our upstate water supply is actually energy positive in that the amount of hydropower we generate exceeds the amount of electri electricity purchased from the grid in the water for our water supply operations. On the BWT side, 
It's important to recognize the scale of our most, va most valuable strategies for carbon and energy neutrality goals, as well as for power resiliency. These most valuable strategies are generated from biosolids and biogas. There is an extreme value in the biogas for heat and electricity generation and in biosolids for carbon sequestration. There's no argument that maximizing the production and beneficial use of biogas presents more opportunity, opportunities to advance us towards energy neutrality, neutrality than any other traditional renewable <coughs> energy investment. Today, we've achieved 30% beneficial use of our digester gas, and with Newtown Creek's gas handling system getting completed this month, as well as North River's cogen operation uh, coming online, that number of beneficial use of biogas will increase to about 56 percent. This continues to be our priority, and we are uh, guiding our investments accordingly. Finally, under energy and carbon and carbon offset strategies, DEP pursues on-site beneficial use of wastewater treatment biogas and biosolids products. We deploy green infrastructure. We manage water demand to reduce our own power needs. We manage wetlands and upstate forest lands that are sequestering atmospheric carbon. As you know, operating and maintaining our complex system of processing 1.3 billion gallons of sewage every day, and that's on a dry day, this is a no small task. We take our responsibilities of being a good neighbor very seriously. We've already taken many steps to improve odor control by proactively identifying and mitigating odor sources through operational changes and also investing in new capital equipment. Um, over the last couple years, I've been proud to institute an odor control task force for all BWT wastewater uh, facilities. Um, it's, the odor control task force kind of operates like a, a SWAT team, so, so to speak. We focus our early efforts at Rockaway and Hunts Point and Owl's Head facilities. And these have resulted in a number of odor mitigation action items. While Hunts Point's near-term action items have been completed and Rockaway items are near completion, we'll continue to look for ways to improve on odor control. As an example, we've improved our response and tracking for 311 nuisance complaints, where on-site investigations are documented and monthly summary reports are issued and shared with local officials and stakeholders. That being said, it is true, I know there's always more that can be done to be a good neighbor. This has been identified as an important strategic initiative in DEP's new strategic plan. DEP supports the goals of member, uh, Council Member Salamanca's proposed legislation, and we look forward to working with the Council to ensure that we uh, achieve our shared goals. So the intro 948 institutes new requirements related to transporting dewatered biosolids, sometimes called sludge, from wastewater, DEP's wastewater resource recovery facilities. Each of our facilities face, face different cha uh, challenges, and we want to make sure that the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't drain resources unnecessarily. In addition, there continues to be new technologies and processes that could have more positive impact locally, and we don't want to miss out on those. We have and will continue to work with local leaders to ensure we are doing everything we can to reduce odor complaints that result from our facility operations. We'll continue to work with our sister agencies to identify and enforce against commercial odor sources like solid waste trucks parked overnight on city streets. The other bill, intro 1165, <coughs> requires specific air quality monitoring outside DEP's wastewater resource recovery facilities. We wholeheartedly share the goal of ensuring safe air quality and protecting public health. We believe that some of the suggested testing parameters always takes, already takes place and some proposed monitoring should be modified. And we believe we can, we can agree on the shared monitoring requirements and work together on them. We look forward to working with elected officials, environmental advocates, and all New Yorkers in meeting DEP's mission of enriching, enriching our environment and protecting public health and providing high quality drinking water, expertly managing wastewater and stormwater, and growing our utilities resiliency and sustainability efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Salamanca for his opening statement, and then I'll, I'll ask some questions and then come back to him. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Constantinides. Uh, good morning, uh, um, Commissioner. 
Um, as part of uh, this hearing uh, today, the committee will hear two of my bills, Introduction 984 and Introduction 1165. I introduced these bills last summer calling attention to the quality of life issues communities surrounding these plants have incurred, communities such as mine. In the city of New York, there are 14 water, wastewater treatment plants uh, throughout all five boroughs that treat 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater daily. Every time a New Yorker flushes, the toilet washes their hands or runs the dishwasher, the water flows into one of these plants. In my district, the Department of Environmental Protection runs the Hunts Point Water Wastewater Treatment Plant, which handles 200 millions of gallons of water per day, the third largest in the city of New York. The large capacity of water treated there brings with it sufficient issues that tremendously affect the neighborhoods, the neighboring communities. Families looking to spend quality time at Barreto Point Park, which is directly across the street from this plant, are subject to pugnant odors that prevent them from enjoying any outside activity. No matter what the city does, the odors remains. And this is not right, and it's totally unacceptable. In addition to disrupting the lives of my constituents, these terrible odors bring with it potentially harmful bacteria or gases. This is why I introduced intro 1165, which would require the city to conduct annual air quality monitoring reports in the areas surrounding the 14 wastewater plants. Reports would test for hazardous air pollutants, such as greenhouse gases, airborne microorganisms, and other bacteria. Once completed, the agency will be required to post the study's findings on its website for the public to see. It's our constituents who are breathing in this air, and we must know fully what is, in, what is that they're breathing. Another issue caused by these plants is when sludge waste cannot be broken down any further. Once sludge waste is dewatered, it's turned into what we call cake, substance that is then delivered to landfills, or other fertilizer plants throughout the country. Last year, headlines were made when biosolid waste from the city of New York was left stranded on a train track in Parrish, Alabama for weeks, leading to smells in the community nearby. However, before these biosolids make it to facilities across the country, they're loaded into containers to be transported via vessels or trucks here in New York City. In my district, more often than not, these containers remain stationary for days until they're picked up, contribu contributing to additional foul odors in the air. To prevent this from occurring, I've introduced intro 984, which will require any company transporting these biosolids to do so with an enclosed container, an odor-proof container. And any company that breaks the law would be subject to fines of up to $1,000. Currently, Brian, if you can get the currently, companies using are using a fine mesh to cover the frails to block the smells from getting into the air. And you can see that is an example of the trucks in my district, and that's the mesh that they're using to cover uh, these uh, the cake, the waste, which I find it unacceptable. We cannot tolerate that anymore. I want to thank Chair Constantinidis once again for hosting this hearing, and I look forward to hearing from the administration. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Salamanca, um, and thank you for your strong advocacy on behalf of your constituents and all the people of the city of New York on these issues. Uh, at this time, uh, we're going to take a short pause. Don't go anywhere, but we're going to have to. We're going to change the tapes and vote on the legislation, and then come back and have questions.
Testing one, two, testing one, two. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip all of this stuff. Um, uh, I am Councilmember Costa Constantinidis still, and I am still chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. Uh, today, the committee will vote on three bills addressing sewer system maintenance and a resolution addressing sea level rise and climate change. In August of 2016, the U.S. EPA found that DEP experienced an excessive number of sewage backups between 2011 and 2015, more than 17,000. There were also numerous instances of repeat backups in the same location due to capacity issues or infrastructure maintenance. Sewage contained a number of biological hazards, including bacteria, funguses, parasites, viruses, blood-borne viruses. Exposure to sewage backups can result in a variety of adverse human health effects, including E. coli, shingliosis, typhoid fever, salmonella, uh, guardia lambalia, hepatitis A and B, among other diseases. Uh, on August 31st, 2016, due to a significant number of confirmed and unconfirmed sewage backups, the EPA issued an administrative compliance order based on its conclusion that DEP uh, treatment system violated the Clean Water Act. The EPA ordered the DEP to prepare an operation and maintenance plan for its collection system that is then approvable. Uh, upon approval, immediately commence implementation of the approved O&M plan. Today's legislation is intended to address that problem. Uh, proposed intro 424A would require the DEP commissioner to ensure that where a sewer segment caused a confirmed back backup is identified, that segment is inspected and cleaned as necessary within 10 calendar days of the confirmation. This local law would take effect immediately. Proposed intro 425A would require DEP to prepare a plan to prevent sewer backups to reduce sewer backups and to target recurring backups. The proposed local law also requires DEP to review the route control strategies of other municipalities and following the review, consider recommending route control strategies for private property owners. This local law will take effect 90 days after enactment. Proposed intro uh, 268A will require the DEP to submit an annual report to the mayor and the council on the number of backflow devices needed, installed, tested, and the number of violations issued for failure to install a backflow device. The new provision will require the DEP to annually report to the council on one, the number of facilities and hazardous facilities estimated to require the installation of backflow prevention devices, two, the number of, of such uh, facilities in which backflow prevention devices have already been installed in the preceding calendar year. Three, the number of annual backflow prevention device test reports filed with DEP in the preceding calendar year. And four, the number of violations issued for the failure to install a backflow prevention device and for the failure to file an annual backflow prevention device test report with DEP. This local law will take effect immediately. Finally, Resolution 509 calls on the United States Army Corps of Engineers to reconsider the proposals made in New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study to consider sea level rise in addition to storm surge. Four out of six of the proposals in the study in include in-water barriers throughout New York Harbor. The in-water barriers are intended to protect against storm surge, the temporary sea level rise created by a coastal storm. However, storm surge barriers rest include restriction of tidal flow, contaminant and sediment transport, and the migration of fish. The restricted tidal flow would prevent sewage and other contaminants from flushing into the ocean, creating more frequent algae blooms and lower dissolved oxygen that is the essential for aqu aquatic life. 
Uh, we want aquatic life to survive and flourish, as we heard in our last part of our hearing. In order for this to happen, we need to limit the discharge of sewage into homes and businesses, rivers and streams, from hazardous facilities and other contaminants, and sediment transport. To improve the future, we need to make changes. I am recommending that we vote for the changes and improve this future. I recommend a yes vote on all. I know we have um, Catherine who's going to make a statement here. I'm making a few. I don't have my, your card in front of me, but I know you pretty well, so I'll give you your, your, the floor to you, and then we'll have the vote. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Constantinides and other uh, distinguished members of this committee. Um, I want to thank you for addressing, um, you know, in your resolution number 509, which I was here last fall testifying on, um, about sea level rise, which continues to be a major issue. Um, as you know, I testified earlier representing the Financial District Neighborhood Association, and I just wanted to bring before you uh, the report that was issued by the U.S. Army Corps uh, last week for the February 2019 report, the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management, and it does include multiple sections on sea level rise. So I just wanted to let you know um, the good news because there's you know a section here on relative sea level rise change. Well, they listened to us, which was great. <laughs> And multi-benefit solutions with natural and nature-based features are preferred in their summary report on page 11. Uh, one of the top two technical topics in which uncertainty should be addressed was the uncertainty related to the appropriately defining the design condition and thus the selection and incorporation of sea level rise scenario. Um, and then also in the summary was funding time legislation bureaucracy hindered the progress of coastal resiliency in many communities within the study area. But there's an urgency to identify CSRM measures prior to another storm or with changing sea level rise condition, and it goes on. So I really want to thank this committee for looking at uh, sea level rise and, by the way, back up. Uh, sewage was a major issue in lower Manhattan during Superstorm Sandy. And as you know, I was chair um, during Superstorm Sandy, and we're still recovering. So I want to thank you for your support. And just for the records, I'll also submitting the latest copy of the Storm Surge Watch newsletter that came out after um, the last hearing. And as you know, the FEMA um, has only been uh, down in Washington, D.C., extended through May 30th, and June 1 is the first day for the 2019 Atlantic hurricane season. So I just want you to, to be mindful of that. But thank you so much for your great work, Chair Constantinides. And thank you very much for your all, always being here, always testifying, always giving uh, your, your good advocacy and, and, uh, and, and, and facts. So I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, uh, recommending a yes vote on all legislation. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on environmental protection. All items are coupled. Chair Constantinides. Vote aye. Levin. Vote aye. Menchaca. Aye. Vote aye. Yeager. Aye. By a vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, all items have been adopted by the committee. Due to the time constraints of the hearing, I am not able to leave the vote open. Um, so um, at this time, I'll gavel uh, this vote closed and, and we'll be reopening our hearing in a minute.
Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Good. All right, so I will gavel this hearing back in. All right, at this time, I will uh, – usually I ask the questions first, but at this time I'll turn it over to Council Member Salamanca for questions, then I'll come back. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Um So, Commissioner, uh, just to get – uh, right to it. Um, there are 14 water filtration plants throughout the city of New York, Hunts Point being the third largest. Um, I know we've met in the past. Uh, you presented a plan. Uh, we visited another water filtration plant. I, I believe it was the Far Rockaways. Um, however, the odors in my district continue to affect my communities. Um, do you keep track of all of your 311 complaints and how is that accessible? Yeah. Um, we do keep track of the 311 complaints on a monthly basis. I get a report, and then I follow through um, on each uh, report from each plant um, and have a conversation on each of the, the incidences and how we followed up. Um, more than uh, a couple years ago, I instituted a odor control task force at the department for the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment, which really ramps up our reaction to 311 complaints. Rather than just logging the complaint, uh, we actually actively go out with handheld monitors, review the perimeter of our sites, also go into neighborhood sites. Um, we also are calling the complainant back uh, to figure out the exact nature of their call. How, how soon do they call back? Does how soon after one files a three one one complaint do you get? So a call? generally, what happens is the complaint comes in. Um, now, first of all, since uh, you're here and there's a members of the public viewing this today. Uh, it's, it's really good that people call, and it's very important that they call as close to the time that they experience the odor a, as possible. So I think that's a great message. And with your, with your particular interest, Council Member, at Hunts Point, it really helped me understand the importance and the engagement that we need to make at the plant. So when the call comes in, the first thing we do is log it in, get as much information we can from the call, the perimeter monitoring happens, and then we will call back the complainants uh, about the results of what we found and maybe get some more information about any uh, unique nature of their, of their incident. So with, It's with been my experience when I've called 311 that I get a call back five hours after my, my complaint. It's good to know. Thank you. And so in five hours, that odor will disappear or evaporate, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, how soon after that 311 complaint is, is, is called in? Does someone from DEP go out and monitor the, the odor in the area? The odor, the odor control directive says that they do that as soon as possible. So, What is as soon as possible? As soon as possible means at a wastewater resource recovery facility, there's a lot of activities going on, right? If there's some kind of emergency situation that they're dealing with or there's a, a higher priority work in terms of life safety or environmental compliance, that would take precedent, but generally it's as, as soon as they get the call, they should be out there in the field. Now, you just told me there was a five hour lag time for you to get called back. To me, that's very good information, very good data. I don't know if we track that as closely as we should. It also means you call it in. I believe there's not much lag between the 311 option. Commissioner, I have a question. If you're not tracking the time that they're calling back, how do you know that they're actually calling back? No, we do track. We, we track, track it. We do track it. I don't, I don't, that's not in the report I received, so I'm going to go back and make sure that I get that data from now on. Just, just really fast to be clear, so I, I have the 311 complaints. I mean, I know you submitted two in March 2017, and I have the exact time. So we definitely keep an inventory of all 311 complaints around the order. Um, Commissioner, in, uh, in the Hunts Point community, you know, we've – look, I've lived in this community my entire life. Uh, I remember a tw being 12 years old, playing in a, in a playground – on the opposite side of Hunts Point, and this smell just came out of nowhere. My my friends and I had no idea what it was. We thought it was a dead animal that was in the air. And it was something that we smell daily in our lives, and we kind of got used to it. It's not until I got involved in local government, in the community board, when I learned about the Hunts Point water filtration plants. I learned about our fertilizer company next door, which was called NIAFCO, uh, and I learned that the community, uh, had, because, because this community was suffering from this odor, they put together what's called the Hunts Point Monitoring Committee, 
which would meet on a monthly basis, would provide a report of 311 complaints, would provide a report uh, as to the scavenger trucks that are coming in and out, right, the porta potty trucks, because they will come and they would dump their waste there, will provide a report of how many tractor trailers were coming in and out, taking the waste out of the community and, and, and taking it out of the community, um, will provide a report of the 301 complaints. And so this committee existed from 2005 to 2013. Then your commissioner then, don't, don't recall who was the commissioner then in 2013, made a, made a decision on their own that they will no longer have these types of, that the Huntsway Monitoring Committee will no longer exist. And so about a year ago, I, uh, I put in a request requesting that DEP reconvene these committees because of the need, because of, you know, there are 14 of these throughout the city of New York. I mean, and so I, I requested that, at least in, in my community, we can reconvene so that DEP can hear firsthand from the communities, once again, the issues that are, that are occurring. And DEP denied that request. Why was that request denied? Let me, let me uh, first talk about the types of monitoring and the reports that you were receiving. With my emphasis on odor and the culture of getting my treatment, uh, my whole infrastructure, my whole organization to treat odor as importantly as we do as every other environmental compliant effort. We've, re, we've engaged on that level for every 311 complaint and activities of the site to provide that report. And I believe you've been getting that report during um, an annual, I'm um, sorry, on a monthly basis. I've, saw, I've gotten about it. maybe three of them in three months. Okay. But don't I'm, you think that those reports that you give me, there should be a live person from DEP that can sit with the answer. committee and, and break down exactly what's happening. And if you see an influx of why on a particular day there were 20 trucks that came in and another day five trucks came in, you can sit down and explain because there's reasons why that happens. Yeah. You can explain to the community why that's happening. So, well, Go ahead. Sorry. That's the purpose of these committees. So I think uh, we would be happy to do some kind of task force or, or group to work on it. I think what you're talking about previously was during the ULERT process where there was additional engineering support to make sure that the things that DEP was talking about in terms of the capital project were accurate and fair and reasonable for the community. And I, I believe that was a part of the ask from the community board. I'm not sure if it was from you, but we feel like since ULERP has been done and the project is you know, approved in the way it's going to be, there's no need for that additional consultant. If you're looking for- This, this was an act that was done that, and that this is something that was happening from 2005 to yep. 2013. A ULERP normally takes a year. Understood. It was the build up to the ULERP. But either way, we're happy to do a recurring community meeting. I mean, we can, we can fashion it in any way you want. I think that additional ask that maybe is getting conflated was for more technical support and that we're not comfortable with. But if you want us to do an ongoing meeting, council member, we're happy to, to do whatever you'd like and however you want to formalize it, we're happy to talk about that. All right. Um, I want to talk about how waste gets in and out of the facility, right? It goes in through piping. You, uh, you separate the waste from the water and you ship it out. And well, you, in, in my district, at least, it, it goes out by tractor trailer. Is it safe to say, and I don't think that these are the exact trailers that you use, but is it safe, safe to say that it's very similar trailers that are used uh, to, to take the waste out of the facility? I, I don't recognize those as our biosolids hauling trailers. But is it safe to say that that's the mesh that you use is very yeah. similar? So let me talk about the mesh. So about, from your leadership and your concern about Hunts Point, and my uh, prioritization of odor as, as a, an important uh, activity at our plant. In fact, uh, odor-free air, in my mind, is a product of the wastewater resource recovery facilities. Odor-free air at the boundary is our goal. So with your emphasis, I have looked at those, plant, those covers, and I, I can't quite see exactly what, what this one looks like, but the, the, the cover we were, had been using was a mesh. And the, the design of that cover was explicitly for the prevention of any biosolids coming out of the truck in transit. Now that is not a design for odor. So several months ago, we impose a requirement on our haulers that they put an impermeable mesh that fully covers the top of the container that is designed uh, for that odor prevention. And it is the state of the art that, that 
biosolids haulers all around the country use. And so no, that mesh, if it is a mesh, is not, is not the design that we uh, allow or, or let happen at our treatment plants. We've made it the upgrade to an impermeable seal. So you're saying that you've incorporated a new system with a new mesh that is odor proof and contains the odor inside the container? The the intent of that see that cover. No, I understand is, the intent. All of the intents it, are, but yes. how? So you're saying that this new mesh that you've asked these holders to use is keeping the odor inside the container. Much better than it. Much better. Much superior to the, the previous. Just keep it in the truck design that was uh, prevalent back then. How does this how does this uh, waste get um, when it when it's put on? Does it get put on rail? So depending on the facility, every uh, dewatering facility is a little bit different. From Hunts Point, uh, one of the main uh, transportation methods is by rail. So it goes from the treatment plant uh, to the rail yard. How does it, now when it's on rail, how, what, is there a, a, an airtight cover that's put on it or is it the mesh? So the, what kind of cover does it so have when it's on, on the rail? rail it's, a, it's a different design for rail long-term hauling. And one of the reasons why what type they, of the design? they have a different kind of uh, yeah. Uh, lid and that lid is designed because the rail car goes long distance and they're actually stacked on top of each other often mm -hmm. and so that's a different technology than the seal we put on at the treatment plant. Site. So the seal that's used on rail is it uh, odor-proof seal? I, I believe it works just as well as a well-designed and the proper seal that we're looking for at the treatment plants themselves. I would just say the council member in his opening testimony referenced some of the, the issues that we had in Alabama it didn't control odor so there it's a it, there's no, I don't think, one catch-all. I mean, but what happened in Alabama is that they, the, these containers stood there for exactly. weeks and months, right? Right, which is why what those caps are, are designed to be for. So just it's hard to say with certainty that 100%, that any work 100% of the time. I don't think that a mesh will do the job. Now, is it safe to say that um, these holders, they, they have to apply, right? These are not uh, DEP trucks. These are private companies that are applying for an RFP, winning the RFP, and you're giving them these contracts, correct? Correct, and they haul it to the destination site. And, and um, most, about 80% of our biosolids product, unfortunately today, goes to landfills, and that's one of the reasons why those trucks were out there in Alabama. Now, the cost of these meshes to change the mesh from the old system to the new system that you referred to, right. is that cost, uh, who pays for that? So the, the upgrade and the, the tarp, the, the impermeable cover on the biosolids trucks itself was, was uh, done by the, the contractor, current contractors that we have. And so the additional cost would have been wrapped into that contract that they, they have with us. So part of the benefit for us in putting pressure on them to do this upgrade was that it could be done within the existing contract. So we didn't have to do a change <laughs> order or re-RFP. Um, so they, we made it clear that it was an important thing for us to have done, but they were able to do it within their existing contract as opposed to having to do a whole new contract. Okay, and these meshes, are they, um, how, how often do they need to be changed? I'm pretty sure that it's, we're talking about, uh, what, cloth yeah. or something, it rips, it breaks with time. How often are you requiring them to, number one, check them to see if there's any holes in them, and number two, are you requiring them to change them, and how often? Well, with, with every hauler, we, we expect the equipment to appear on site, all the equipment to appear on site that is, des that is specified in the contract to work that well. So yes, we have a checklist. A hauler pulls into our site. Pulls into our, site. Um, our staff review what, what they're coming there for and look at when, as they're filling their biosolids trucks and putting the, the impermeable covers over the quality and, make, and, and follow through in our checklist to make sure that's all set. Now, if a hauler comes shows up with inadequate anything, they're not allowed to haul. But, and I would just add, council member, I think that's probably something we haven't done enough of, so that's probably something we could try to require a certain amount of times, you know, per whatever length of time to make sure that they're still in the condition that we would require. So we're happy to look into that. Mr. Chair, I have a lot of other questions, but I, I'll, I'll let my colleagues ask their questions and I'll come back. Yeah. Thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. Uh, this time I'll pass uh, to Councilmember Levin for questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. I just want to ask a little bit about Newtown Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility, um, the, the data on the number of 301 complaints there and what you're seeing as a, as a result of uh, efforts to do odor control there. 
So uh, I pulled the reports for Councilman Salamanca because I knew it was going to be a priority. I don't have the specifics for each facility, but I'm happy to get it for you. I don't believe that there's been anything out of the ordinary or a high frequency or volume of 311 complaints. Okay. Um, uh, Councilmember Salamanca mentioned uh, the Hunts Point Monitoring Committee. Um, what's the status of the Newtown Creek Monitoring Committee and uh, what's the outlook for, for that for that uh, organization as well? So Nick Mick uh, is meeting sort of when they're when they're wanting to. It hasn't mm -hmm. been monthly as it had been previously. There we're finishing phase two and three of the nature walk. Um, and when that once that construction is done, the obligations of the monitoring committee will be will have been met, so it will end. Um, and then have you spoken with them about this? Yeah, they, they're aware of that. Okay. And what's their reaction been to that? Uh, I'm sure it runs the gamut. I'm not, I'm, okay. I don't know. I can't speak of, as a unified voice. When do you expect it to be completed? I think we're two years, 18 months, two years away from completion. Okay. Um, uh, I can't cite the studies specifically, but there, I guess there's been some studies to show. I'm just curious about... Um, with uh, with the bio ha uh, biosolid application sites, mm -hmm. um, there's been in, there's some series of shown an increase in uh, staph infections. Is that are you familiar with any so, studies? So um, I'm very familiar with biosolids land application. Even though New York City does not have that as the primary beneficial use program today, mm -hmm. I, I started my job about three years ago. I came from the West Coast. We had a very robust biosolids land application program. I'm very familiar with the science behind. Uh, the, the application, the concerns from the community, the concerns from science communities, and working together to figure out the best solution uh, for the biosolids products. Now, biosolids products are uh, one of the best fertilizers for carbon sequestration. It is, it, it enabled the facilities I ran on the West Coast in the metropolitan Seattle area to run our wastewater operations at carbon neutrality, which is really amazing and I'd like that goal uh, mm -hmm. here in New York City. But of course, because it comes from human waste, it has stigma. So uh, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of uh, uh, concentrated effort with community members to look at the actual risk. If you take uh, steer manure, which people think, oh, you can go buy steer manure, it's great stuff, and you, do, and you compare it to what's in biosolids, you'll find a lot more pharmaceuticals a lot more um, uh, potential, uh, what people think contaminants of concern in that concentrated uh, waste than you do in biosolids. Biosolids is heavily, heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. And I am not interested as a, a purveyor of public health, the reason why we have wastewater treatment facilities in the first place, to create any additional mm -hmm. uh, harm and risks. So with the, with the proper oversight, monitoring, controls on the site, and a whole slew of 5013 regulations, which is what the, the EPA follows, it is a very safe, valuable product that we can't, we really should not be continuing to landfill this, mm -hmm. this resource. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Uh, Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the... Uh, my two predecessor council members uh, referenced uh, two monitoring committees in their neighborhoods, and I don't know if either of you worked for DEP in 2013, but are you able to speak to why the Hunts Point Monitoring Committee was disbanded versus the uh, Newton Monitoring Committee, which still exists? Because I, I just found out from Councilman Levin's questions that Newtown still exists. I just thought yeah, that they I were don't, all disbanded. I, no. I don't, I'm not sure why the decision was specifically made to Hunts Point, but I'm happy to figure it out. I think it had something to do with the actual construction project, but I don't know. How difficult would it be to reconstitute it? Yeah, again, I think we're happy to have a okay. recurring meeting with folks. All right. Um, that's good. Uh, I, you know, normally when agencies come here, they're kind of very clear on, you know, we like the bill, we don't like the bill, uh, we don't support it, we do support it. And uh, with respect to 984 and 1165, um, it doesn't really say that you don't support it and it doesn't say that you do support it. So can I take that to mean that the administration is happy to see this advance to the stage and would like this committee to pass this bill and move it to the floor? Uh, well, as the person in charge of all the wastewater resource recovery facilities and all the collection facilities, I fully support the intent behind both of these. They're both geared towards providing 
good neighbor activities from our treatment plants, uh, protecting public health and protecting the public. The specifics of each of the bill, uh, I believe we could work together to meet the objectives of what they're well, about. Is, well, you, I, I believe you're, you're uh, a true advocate on this, and I believe that, that uh, you're a consummate professional and you, you believe in this goal very much. You don't have to convince me. Is there anything in the bill that you don't like that you can tell us about right now? Okay, so okay. Let, let me talk about the, the air monitoring one, uh, okay. for starters. So when you think about uh, the, the types of concerns that are brought up in the specific types of monitoring, and you look at what's been happening over the last several decades in terms of potential risk at wastewater treatment facilities, the ground zero case studies have been the sewage treatment workers, the operators, the people who work at the treatment plants about the types of potential airborne uh, contaminants that might hurt them. So there's been huge studies and bodies of knowledge over those uh, past several decades studying uh, those impacts as well as a concern about potential uh, downwind communities. And with that, we, we monitor our employees. Um, Anytime there's a new uh, a virus or a public health concern, Ebola is an example, or uh, when the HIV uh, virus was, was starting to be noticed, um, there's, again, extensive studies about how that might impact the, the people at the treatment plant and also uh, people downstream from there. So the, the type of parameters that are listed here are not necessarily the best targeted towards those human health outcomes, what I would do is bring up the science and the research that have been um, geared towards the, the wastewater treatment plant worker, see where it makes sense, which ones are actually uh, valuable information that we could monitor for. Some of these are not really practical or, or uh, possible. Um, but gearing that is where I'd want to go. Okay. So, you know, bills, as you know, are, they're not written by scientists here in the council. They're written by lawyers. But the, the, uh, the bill that you're talking about is the 1165 intro um, uh, by Chair Salamanca. And it, it says the program shall annually measure and record the levels of air pollutants that are hazardous to human health, comma. And then it has, you know, as we learn in law school, it has the, the qualifiers, including but not limited to. Right. But the first part of that sentence is what is what I would think you, you're indicating you're okay with that, and maybe we didn't get it right of what the including but not limited to should include, and maybe there are things mm -hmm. in addition to, but that's within the commissioner's uh, um, purview, I guess, to decide what necessarily uh, should be included. However, the, at the core, his bill essentially just requires you to measure and record the levels of, I mean, I tend to try to get out the, 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 uh, the extra, annually measure and record the levels of the air pollutants that are hazardous to human health. Put a period there instead of a comma. You, you're doing that anyway for your employees. There are employees too. They work for the city. They draw our, our checks and, you know, we're paying them. We care about their health. So, th their health. So, the, the notion that, um, you know, maybe we didn't, name the right scientific thing, mm -hmm. okay, so big deal. I mean, can, yep. we, can we pass the bill as is? Um, no. Okay. No. What word's missing? <laughs> I mean, there's, <laughs> there's- You're a smart guy. There's a, de there's a decent amount that would- He's right here. Change. No, I understand. I okay. mean, we're happy, to, we're, we're happy to go through it, I think. No, I always have this frustration, and, and, it, and uh, it's I, not on you. I, I do this at all the hearings every time I have this, and you know, anybody who's seen me, I do this at every hearing. You, you, the bill's introduced, you know, it's 1165 and, and, uh, and 984, quite some time ago. And um, you've seen the bill before this morning. And, you know, the opportunity to come before the council and say, you know, we, we're not ready, don't pass this bill as is. Give us a better draft. He'll amend it tomorrow and send it up and, you know, we'll move it. I mean, what's yeah. the, you know, I, I just this whole dance of, you know, and, and I, I believe that you're into this, I believe you're committed to the cause 100%, but this notion that, you know, it's maybe we didn't land on the right language, just give us the language. Yeah. Okay. We're happy to. So, but we, but, we, but we want to do the annual uh, measuring oh, and, re absolutely. and recordation. I want to give you annual reports. Okay. I want to I put them on the internet. I hate reporting I want bills, to but go this to is one that I could boards. live with. I want to meet every community board okay. that has a wastewater treatment facility. Good. And I want to answer their questions. I, I, and, and I don't, I don't mean to, to, to yes. dance on, on Chair Salamanca's uh, parade on this um, because, you know, I've, 
I have a lot of respect for my colleagues here in the council, but the ones who toiled in community boards, I have a special kind of love because um, I was on a community board for 18 years, and uh, it's you know the Rodney Dangerfield of city government, um, and and uh, Mr. Salamanca has uh, incredible you know I have a little to do with the Bronx, those who know me, um, and he has a, he has an incredible reach in that community, and you know he grew up there and he's been living with it, so let's go to 984. Nine. Okay, so yes or no? Can we pass this? As is, no. Okay, what's the problem? Um, there's a couple problems. Okay. Well, Pam, do you want to go? Yeah, or, so. Hands here right now. Yeah. Um, I believe the state of using impermeable seals on top of our biosolids trucks that are flexible, that is the state of the art of the biosolid truck seal from wastewater resource recovery facilities. The does that mean, I'm sorry, ma'am, Commissioner, yes. that, does that mean that, well, because obviously the mesh thing allows odors to come through. Yeah, and no more mesh. And mesh. mesh is there to prevent the, the, the particles from escaping. Does that mean that a steel cover that completely in, encloses is not good because the gas builds up? I mean, I'm so let me talk about the steel cover okay. that completely encloses it. I, I think you may have seen the, the facility at the rail yard that this, the cover, the cap system there, that's for designed for the rail. For the track. So if we were to require our contractors to do that, um, first of all, the sizes of the trucks would be smaller than our large biosolids hauling trucks. Okay, why? Because the container, the shipping container that goes on the rails, now we're switching from the longer bed truck, sometimes they're double, um, to a smaller facility, right? A, a smaller vessel okay. itself. So now I'm um, increasing the number of trucks to the facility. So therefore I'm increasing the amount of traffic, which is a neighborhood con uh, concern, the amount of uh, potential air pollution from the exhaust of these vehicles. So the idea that we require a specific technology or a specific system for all wastewater treatment facilities doesn't allow us the best option for each of those sites. Don't have the flexibility. Don't have the flexibility. Okay. Do they not make uh, uh, completely uh, steel or whatnot, whatever works, uh, covers for the larger containers? Is that not something that, that is manufactured? Is that not the uh, Currently, there thing? is not a, a biosolids hauling technology that is what you described. Only there's, the smaller there's the containers. rail car version that we see at the rail yards. So if we were to say, okay, we want you to, we want you contractors, biosolids hauling companies, uh, to now have a sealed lid just like the rail yard that's going to be designed towards uh, towards your truck. So that that's a complete game changer for uh, the people who haul for us now. Uh, we would have to have we would have to construct lidding facilities at each of the wastewater resource recovery facilities. The contractors would have to modify the entire fleet of their vehicles, most likely. So that's one half of the solution. Let me ask a question. I'm sorry. It was, I like the f informal back and forth. Um, it, they, these larger containers have to anyway be offloaded into the smaller containers when they get to the rail yard. Is that not correct? No. Um, okay. Some of the trucks that go to Hunts Point go to the rail yard. Some go to uh, long haul to the land at, or the landfilling sites. As is with those mesh covers. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yes, the okay. incredible covers. But the other, you brought up a great point where they haul to. So I just described putting the lids on at the site. So now they're hauling from the trucks to uh, uh, a land filling area or potentially a land application site. So th at that site, they'd have to reconstruct the same delitting facility, which is um, right now that doesn't really exist in the land fills or the land application potential areas. It does exist where rail cars are used. And so that's been the niche market for um, the leading delitting facilities for rail cars. So you're really talking about a, a sweeping industrial change and limiting the number of landfills to very few that we could uh, currently haul to or, or future land application sites where we could take advantage of the fertilizer product. But I just want to be clear, that doesn't mean that we don't, un we totally understand the council member's issue and I, the longstanding nobody issue. Nobody here we're trying disputes to figure that out the agency the best does solution. No, I know, I just want to, we're not you know, disagreeing with that you. You want bad smells on the streets of right. the Bronx. We're nobody, just trying to figure out the best that. way. We want to alleviate every smell at Hunts. So l let me ask this uh, um, maybe environmentally stupid question. Is there, um, if, if the, you know, maybe it's maybe it's all a balancing act. But if the balancing act 
you know, with the thumb on the scale of the people who live in the neighborhood is that they don't want the smells. Um, is that worth the trade-off of simply saying that the technology that the city is going to use and allow to be used is going to require these to be uh, sealed to prohibit the smells? From, because so otherwise you don't have something that can keep the smells from coming out. I, I, you just hit on uh, the nail on the head. The objective is the community does not want odors. The community does not want odors. My priority is to figure out what is the real cause of the odors and how are we going to reduce it. So we did an extensive, uh, because we developed this odor control task force, we developed a list of activities at the Hunts Point plant that we needed to take care of and completed all the near term um, uh, commitments on that front. So I don't want to say, look, I'm going to seal the trucks and it's all over and now um, there's going to be no more odors out of Hunts Point. That, that's probably not the problem. If, if there is actually odors coming from our facility that are generated from our operations, I need to pinpoint the problem. I need to have my, my people on the site with their meters, with their um, activities honed. I need to instill the idea that we treat air here just like we treat clean water. There's a number of things we've done at that site that, for example, taking the scavenger manhole, moving it from the street into the facility so that it's not in the, around where the public are. This is the, the porta potty type haulers that come in. Um, looking at, there were some places where uh, the, the liquid streams would combine in a certain area of the plant that created an aerosol local to that area that could have been transmitting off site. That's been taken care of. So there's we've got to pinpoint the real problem and address it. If there's ways we need to invest in better air control technology from some of the buildings that do process uh, the wastewater and solids that currently have uh, air control systems attached to it, are they performing as we expect them to do? There's a whole range so of things. I, I, I understand the point that, that you're making, which is that at the core, you don't want smells, odors to, to come from the plants themselves but at the end of the day if um, that requires you to do a lot of you know what with your meters and your checking and your this but if you just figure out a way to seal the lids on these containers when they're moving around I mean you're are you suggesting that 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 we that the council in in uh, in introducing this bill has identified the wrong cause of the odors in the neighborhood which you know, that's a fair suggestion, if that's so, right. Just really quickly, in the testimony, we also allude to trucks similar to the ones that are in this picture that are often sitting all around the perimeter of the site that we do think are adding to the, the so we're working with DOT to try and get more stringent rules about not parking overnight, more enforcement. We do think that there are other factors that are contributing to the odor in the neighborhood. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a minute. I'm gonna talk about a few other issues in relation to this hearing today. We know it's, it's also on sustainability and resiliency of those all of these plants. Um, so walk me through, uh, I know you, you have some uh, resiliency measures that are being taken at the various sites. I know that the one in my community, Bowery Bay, uh, walk me through uh, those resiliency uh, measures and completion dates and, and what, are we, or is, what, what is sort of the benefit of getting those done in the timelines. Okay, great. Um, so resiliency is important. We have billions of dollars invested, <laughs> and we really want to make sure we, we are uh, here for the long haul uh, and, and, and being cost effective and doing our job under all conditions. So with this uh, 2013 plan, there's been a lot of work identifying uh, the best and most uh, prudent investments. Um, I actually reviewed this plan long before I got my job because I was very impressed with it. So I'm very uh, just kind of thrilled to be on the other side of, of working on this. So we have eight facilities that have been identified as the high priority areas. Um, and those facilities have projects, some are complete, some are ongoing. And by 2021, we will be uh, completely done with those eight facilities identified. Now I have specifics on those eight sites. I have a right, I know nice the thing site plan for Barry Bay. Even. I, you, you sent me that on <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday. I don't remember which day of the week it was. But I mean, I know for me, looking at our flood maps, uh, I mean, I look at Bowery Bay. I know that's in, you know, that's uh, in our part of my district. That's probably the most flood prone or has potential for flood, uh, flood happening. 
Um, what are we doing to make sure that you know, if there were to be a large storm uh, what, of, a, of a large magnitude, what happens there? How are we keeping that, that, that site working in the long term? Specifically at Barry Bay? Yeah. Okay, so um, we've got flood protection upgrades at the facility. Uh, most of that is, uh, is completing design right now, so we can start so uh, construction in 2019. I, just really quick, I think you do specific have this, areas. but we have specific, a map of, sort of a road map of exactly what we're doing. So we're uh, putting flood barriers around the most essential equipment. We're adding uh, flood, pr flood proof equipment. We're elevating important equipment. I mean, we're installing and elevating equipment, just, but it runs the gamut, and it's on literally almost every piece of infrastructure at Bowery Bay. Okay, now looking at, you know, so these, this will be done by 2021. Correct. Are we linking these projects with sustainability measures? Like, are we, since we know we're doing construction, I've asked you this question before, but I'll make yeah. sure I, <laughs> yeah. so are we linking these projects with sustainability opportunities to lower the carbon footprint of these plants and also help contribute to reducing our emissions 80% by 2050? That's a great question. So, with every capital project now, and specifically resiliency projects, we have a program to link sustainability through multiple efforts. One is the design itself, but then we have these energy conservation, state of good repair integration plans, which while we're working on elevating the electrical gear, let's upgrade the electrical gear. There's a number of activities that are following through actively. So what are the, we know the emissions reductions that we will get I'm, again, I'm using Bowery Bay as an example, but I know there are eight of these that are going on. What are the emissions reductions from upgrading that equipment that we're going to see? So can I, ju I just want to be clear. So the, this funding is re received through grants that we're getting from FEMA and, okay. and New York State. And so I'm, I don't know for sure, and I will double check this, but I think there are some restrictions to how we can actually spend the money. These are really going towards... If, San if Sandy comes again or something worse comes, right. how do we structure it? It's a different, it's a different goal, and I don't think we've fully incorporated into this project some of the stuff that we're also working on in a, in a parallel path. Uh, it, but what have there been ways for us to, to piggyback on this construction since we were doing it anyway to put our own money in? I'm not saying that right. FEMA should have paid for it. I'm saying that should we have built in some of these resiliency yeah. measures, I mean sustainability measures, since we're doing the construction anyway, we're going to have contractors. We're doing this. They're not, way. They're not really the same type of project. So, so yeah. with the, ex I mean, sometimes we're building a barrier, right? And a right. barrier might just be like a three-foot uh, you know, block that we're going to put at doorways. Or we have these HESCO dams, which are these barriers around the perimeter. But when you talk about elevating electrical gear, mm -hmm. so when I start looking at this, it's like, oh, we're going to elevate the electrical. My question was. You're going to elevate existing old electrical gear that we should have replaced, you know, 10 years ago. So, so then we got the money together. I'm thinking together. the same thing, Pam. Right. We got the money together. Okay, we're going to elevate the electrical gear and upgrade it. I don't, you know, I don't want you to elevate my old gear. I want the new gear while you're doing it. So that's an important aspect of it. Absolutely. And then, and then we are really, we are pretty precise about greenhouse gas emissions over time. I have this great chart showing the the decrease mm -hmm. over time. No, you guys are doing it and so really for well. everything we do, we're looking at what is the greenhouse gas benefit to us or what is the cost? The thing that's most amazing about this downward trend, trends going down, at the same time we're adding new facilities that are that require more energy. So it's not just this reduction, but it's this reduction plus additional consumption that that we have to monitor and track and move down the, down this I, mean, I, mean, I told you I was going to ask you these questions today, so it's not like this is a surprise. Um, you know, I mean, in my district, probably the largest governmental grouping of for potential for solar over 200,000 square feet is on the Bowery Bay wastewater treatment plant. You know, if you added up all my, you know, several of my schools, they don't come even close to that. Uh, I'm, you, you know what I'm advocating for, right? I, we have had these conversations. If we were able to add a solar component mm -hmm. um, to Bowery Bay, 200,000 square feet. Now, all those square feet would be eligible, right. but being the fact that it's in a flight path to the airport, we're never going to get a large building that's built next to it. We're never going to have anything built to it that's going to block out that, those solar panels. We have an opportunity here. I'd like to, and I'll, I'll reiterate on the record, yeah. right? I, I, I never miss an opportunity. Um, that if we're able to, to do something there, it's something that could be for, to have a major benefit. Great. Agreed.
Agreed. With you. So let, let's still try. I know that's construction that's going on, yep. mm-hmm. right? And since they weren't baked into the cake, we have to wait for that construction to get done first. But let's let's figure out a way to get there. And the and the project at Wards Island that we're doing that's similar in scope on a bigger plot of land, I think, is something that is a valuable sort of for understanding how this works and for doing future projects similar to you. It'll be a good uh, a good jump off point. Now, I mean, the last question I have before I test it back to Councilmember Salamanca is, you know, so this is the sh- this is the short term, right? We're repairing. I know that Bowery Bay is 80 years old this year. Mm-hmm. 80 years old. It's yeah. it's in good shape for 80. It is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's good 80. Got, got, uh, a, got a few know, knees. It, it, it's places. looking good for 80 years old. Um, but, you know, in, in 20 years, it'll be 100. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have an opportunity uh, with – potentially Rikers Island coming off line. And, and, and there are a myriad of reasons that Rikers Island should be closed, many of which dealing with the social justice aspect. Um, you know, for, for justice, it should be closed. But once it's closed, we have an opportunity f- when it comes to environmental justice to replace uh, a lot of these wastewater treatment plants with a larger plant on Rikers that could potentially take a wastewater treatment plant out of Councilmember Salamanca's neighborhood, take a wastewater treatment plant out of Astoria, take them out of environmental justice communities. What are your thoughts on this opportunity um, for not only using uh, part of Rikers Island for solar, which, by the way, could replace every power plant built in the last 20 years in our city, but also building a large enough wastewater treatment plant there to reclaim these na- these, these points of of contention in residential communities, mostly in communities of color, mostly in environmental justice communities. What are your thoughts about that moving forward? So uh, the, like I said, we started working this work in 1890. We've got to do our work today and plan for the future. And when you look at this this infrastructure getting to be 100 years old, that is a, a great time is right now to start looking at that future of where is the best investments, which locations, and which technologies are best for us all. And I, I, I'm 100% behind you in looking at it as a as a plan. It's not that far in the distance, so it should be we should seriously look at the um, pros and cons of moving in that direction. Absolutely. And the Lipman report brought that up, but just looking at it, I mean, the the only run we don't need another runway in Queens. We need a runway to renewables and a, and a runway to getting rid of these wastewater treatment plants in environmental justice communities. As far as I'm concerned. Yep, it's definitely something that we've thought about and are looking into as well. Great. I know it's not going to get done tomorrow. We have a lot of work to do between now and then, um, but I think that. It's something that I'll be very much interested in working with the administration on. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Councilmember Salamanca for additional questions. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, why not talk a little bit about the um, Intro 1165, um, the, uh, the reporting bill, more in terms of monitoring the air quality and the airborne, I guess, about solids that can be in the in in the in the air, and I and I want to and I want to start with this. So there are fourteen, there are fourteen water filtration plants throughout the city of New York. Um, do you do you host? Does DEP host a um, monitoring committee, which all with all fourteen, or do do you only do it when you're going through a EULA process and you're asking that community board to approve your application? They are not. A- they are not at all 14, and I believe they have to do with capital construction projects, but I'm not sure the exact parameters of what triggers it to happen. But they are for major upgrades in, in, in working with the community to understand our needs, to walk them through the engineering, architecture process, including ULERP, and then through the construction process to make sure the quality of life issues, et cetera, are dealt with. But see, your agency is a little different. Quality of life issues for your agency happen, will happen forever because of the potentials for the older going into the community. Right. Opposed to a construction, you have quality of life issues, the disruption of traffic, you know, uh, the loading and unloading, only through that construction phase. Yeah. You know, in the city of New York, we have two types of developers. We have a good developer, which is a good neighbor, which comes to the community board uh, before he, uh, he, he starts to design to ask the community what exactly they're asking for, what exactly are the needs of the community so they can build the right way. And then you have the other developers who, who come in with a design, say, this is what I'm going to build. 
um, and only, you know, comes to the community board during that application process, promises them the world. Once they get that letter of support, we never hear from them again. So wouldn't it be responsible of DEP to, uh, to have a monthly or bi-monthly monitoring committee with every community that you're in, all 14 communities, to give them this type of information in terms of 301 complaints, what's actually happening in their plants, because I'm sure it's affecting every community. The op your operation is affecting every community. So I think we're happy to, so I, I think we need to agree on what the definition of a monitoring committee is, because I think there are very different types of mon monitoring co com committees depending on what the project is. So. For Gowanus, where it's a super fund and there's a required EPA action, they have a formal pro So there's different types of things. So yeah, I mean, we look, we have members of the staff attend every community board meeting largely as much as possible. I think there's environmental committees of the, the community boards where we, this seems like a perfect place to do it. But if you want to go above and beyond and do something different, I think we're, we're open to, to qualifying it. We just need to understand exactly what you mean by monitoring committee. I, I think that similar to what we had in the Hunts Point, the HIPNIC committee, the Hunts Point Monitoring Committee, where you came with reports, right. someone from DEP actually explained what those reports are, why they may have been, you know, spikes, uh, in, spikes in, in 311 complaints. I think it's important. I think it's, it's called res being a responsible neighbor, responsible agency. So a community that is, we don't want this, these, these, uh, these, uh, these plants in our communities, right. but they're there. You know, so if they're going to be there and we have to coexist, you know, there should be an extra effort from your agency to not only say, you know, take your word out, we're trying to reduce the odors, but show us on a monthly basis or bi-monthly basis what's happening and how you are addressing those issues. Now, going to my bill here, um, so there are what's called these um, odor monitors that you have, right? These are, what are these, pieces of machine that go and they detect the odor? with this high odor? Yeah, Tell so uh, there's handheld monitors, there's also stationary monitors throughout the, the plant itself. And so the target odor compound we look for is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is indicative of uh, there being sewage odors in the vicinity and also you it would also cover if there's hydrogen sulfide, there might be other things we're worried about. So if we're going to hit the hydrogen sulfide and figure out the source and control. Hydrogen sulfide, you said, That's right? correct. Okay. Now, these monitors, uh, these air monitors, do you have them spread out throughout um, all, all plants? Well, every plant has air monitors. Like I said, some are stationary next to or, or within buildings, particularly for worker safety. Okay. okay? But the handheld uh, is a routine survey that my plant staff do, as well as response to 311 calls. How many of these uh, air monitors do you have average per plant? I, I can't tell you. I can get you that information. Okay. More than one? Yes. Okay. More than five? I don't know. I have to get you that information. Okay. Um, these, um, these monitors, what else do they do? They detect anything, any particles or any, anything in the air other than just the smell, bad odor? Those, those monitors are dying for H2S, which is indicative of there being a sewage problem in the area. The, there's been a, a huge body of study around particulate and bacterial and other kind of contaminants that might affect the sewage workers like I was talking to you about. And the science also drives that if you have a H2S meter, that's the key for there being a problem with potential sewer, uh, sewage odors in the air, which may contain these other contaminants. So the, that, that body of study has really driven us as an industry to look at H2S as the indicator, just like fecal coliform is an indicator bacteria for wastewater and receiving waters. Okay. Are there any airborne pollutants that exceed DEP's regulations outside of the plants? Do you have a touch for that? Um, yeah, there's required uh, Department of uh, uh, DEC, as well as the Health Department. There's regular air monitors around uh, parts of the city. That's They do ambient air monitoring. They don't necessarily do targeted air monitoring, but they do ambient air monitoring. Do you ever monitor the air outside of your plants? Yes, we do. So when there's a 311 call, for example, at Hunts Point, since we started that odor contr uh, control task force being more responsive, when there is a call, we do within the plant, and we also do in the neighborhood around the plant.
Um, do any particular plants produce more odor complaints than others? I can get that history of records or odor. You don't have that here with complaints. you? I don't have that with me So right now. Do, I'm pretty sure you know who are your top three plants that have the most complaints, just like I know where my top three areas in my community have the highest crime. Right. I'm pretty sure that's something. Well, to be uh, honest, it, it rotates. Like, I, I get a monthly report, and I'll see, you generally, I don't see a trend, but I can I will pull that data out and, and uh, have that summarized for you. I have an annual report that we could we could provide. It often, if there's a specific issue within the facility, it might drive up complaints temporarily because we, like I said, we have malfunctions, we have equipment stuff, so it's it does sort of run the gamut. All right, um, where which is your oldest uh, plant that needs capital improvements? Other than Hunts Point, I know we're going to get it. So, so every plant, um, you know, Newtown Creek is probably the newest, so to speak, and that's already 20 years old, 30, pushing for uh, some of it. Um, they all need capital investment. We're, we're constantly looking at uh, our asset management protocol to prioritize those investments. So there's no one, I would say, is any worse or... And where are we with the construction of the new uh, water wastewater treatment plant in Hunts Point? So you're talking about the, the digestion complex there? Yes. So that is currently in design. The design is wrapping up probably this year, and then the construction will start probably in the t uh, 2021 uh, time frame, um, expected to be about a three-year construction period. All right. Um, so, look, I, I look forward to working with you on these bills. Um, I have many concerns. Again, my community, to this day, we're suffering from this odor. Construction is coming. There's a lot of work that needs to happen. There's a lot of community conversations that must happen. Um, I look forward to uh, really sitting down with you on intro 984 and 1165 to see how we can come to some type of, um, you know, I, I would say, I don't want to say agreement, but see how we can work close, how we can work together so that we can try to resolve uh, these older issues. But something that I am highly going to recommend is that you create monitoring committees for all 14 plants. I mean, it, that's being a responsible agency. You're, the work that you do is important work, but it is also affecting our quality of life, especially in the Hunts Point community. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, I thank you uh, for allowing me to have this hearing. Thank you, Councilmember Salmonk, and thank you for all that you're doing. I, I know Councilmember Yeager has one question. He's one, promised me I, one, one question. One question. Um, <laughs> do you, just to follow up on uh, one of his last two questions, do you maintain uh, uh, a record of the, when you do the readout, whether it's for the permanently uh, stationed air monitors or whether it's the handhelds, you keep that data? Yes. Okay, so as part of, um, I guess, this reporting, you're able to kind of go back and see over a period of time, you know, the pattern. odor was oh, yeah. bad, odor was good, right. odor, okay. So, I'm, and the other thing we've started doing too is uh, we have a lot of tanks at the treatment plant that uh, contain the liquid when it first comes in that's in, under the treatment process. And sometimes we have to take those tanks down for repair and maintenance. And it used to be we just did that. And now when we know we're going to do that, we inform uh, the community boards, we inform the neighborhoods, we, because that might potentially cause an odor problem. And then we institute what odor mitigation efforts are going to happen during that exercise. So we're trying to be a lot more proactive around that. And that's part of our reporting as well. Thank you very much for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, Commissioner, it's, it's always good to see you. We've started our friendship on top of a uh, wastewater treatment uh, facility yeah. a couple of years back in, in, on Bowery Bay. Yeah, on top of – actually, on, on top of the tanks. Well, good friendship all. start on top of the tanks. <laughs> Best place <laughs> and, to be. You know, we, we finally sealed those tanks after many years of, of residents complaining about the smell. Um, so thank you for your efforts, and I look forward to working with you not on these bills, but all the issues that we discussed today. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have two people to testify. We have Phil Voss from Energy Vision and Adriana Espinosa from League of Conservation Voters.
All right, hey Jenna, uh, we'll, we'll start with you. Great, thanks. Like uh, good afternoon. My name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. We have over 31,000 members in New York City and we're committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. Uh, thank you to Chair Constantinides for the opportunity to be here to testify today. Uh, so on an individual level, there's plenty we can do to promote clean waterways and protect sustainability of our wastewater treatment plants, properly disposing of garbage and household chemicals, conserving water, and limiting use of water during heavy precipitation events are all behaviors that New Yorkers can adopt to promote clean water. And it's important that we all do what we can to fight climate change. And that's why today I want to highlight an opportunity New York City has to enhance the sustainability not only of our wastewater treatment plants, but also help to meet two 1 NYC goals, 80 by 50 and uh, zero waste by 2030. And there are, these are things that are entirely in the control of the city and can and must be done. In this case, NYLCB strongly recommends that the city upgrade DEP's existing digesters, which manage sewer sludge to be more efficient. The energy used at modernized digesters could be used to offset or eliminate the need for demand response generators at these locations. This would reduce air pollution and cut down on methane emissions, a greenhouse gas 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. We urge the mayor and city council to invest funds necessary to modernize DEP's network of digesters. But those digesters can do a lot more than just manage the waste created by the wastewater treatment plants. In 2015, NYLCB's Education Fund released a series of policy recommendations for an effective organic waste program in New York City. These recommendations asked the city to maximize the use of anaerobic digestion at DEP's wastewater treatment plants. While, Newtown, now, while the Newtown Creek uh, plant is authorized to accept up to 500 tons per day of organic waste and has a contract with waste management to receive this waste, none of DEP's other digesters do. In addition, we support a collaboration between DEP and DSNY to make provisions for high quality organic waste similar to that at Newtown at other wastewater treatment plants. This investment could contribute to the uh, city's zero waste goal and support the struggling residential organic waste progr program by stimulating demand for organic waste. Converting this waste into renewable energy contributes to better air quality, lower emissions, and can potentially save the city money over time as the energy generated is used to power these plants. I'd like to again thank Chair Constantinides for, the time, for your time and the committee for your leadership in the environment. Thanks. Uh, all great ideas, things that we should be doing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Voss? Um, I think you're going to see a theme developing over here. <laughs> um, I, my name is Phil Voss. I'm a program director at Energy Vision. We are an environmental nonprofit focused on commercial and cost effective options for decarbonizing our economy. I'd like to thank the committee, the chair, and Commissioner Alardo for her testimony. Um, further to the legislation that is under consideration, uh, as has been indicated by Adriana, uh, systems to help address the issues of odor and of um, air quality, including greenhouse gas emissions, are already in place at New York City's wastewater treatment facilities. Um, but in many cases, these systems are in need of upgrade and repair. They are the anaerobic digesters, critical infrastructure that also helps address the city's larger sustainability goals. Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, anaerobic digestion is the decomposition of organic materials in the absence of oxygen. At wastewater treatment plants, sewage is anaerobically digested in sealed vessels over a period of weeks. And by the end of the process, the organic matter has been decreased in volume, its odor has been greatly reduced, and it contains lower levels of pathogens. This process also captures a significant amount of methane as biogas. This is all part of the normal operation of a modern wastewater facility, but digester function can be improved at many of the city's wastewater treatment plants with refurbishment, and we understand this to be very much on DEP's radar. Further to air quality and uh, greenhouse gas reduction, biogas capture is critically important. Biogas from anaerobic digestion of sewage is 55 to 60 percent methane. A, near, a greenhouse gas with, uh, in the short term, 86 times the global warming of potential of carbon dioxide, 30 times over the longer term. Uncaptured, this methane would escape into the atmosphere, accelerating the process of climate change. Wastewater plants that capture biogas generally burn it on site to produce heat and or electricity. Surplus gas is flared or burned off. 
uh, per Commissioner Rolardo's testimony, 70% of the biogas is currently flared, though that will soon improve. There is a better option and significant opportunity for the surplus gas, upgrade it to pipeline quality biomethane. Biomethane can be used for all the same things as conventional natural gas, heating and cooling, electricity generation as vehicle fuel, but its GHG emissions are 50% or more lower on a life cycle basis. Biomethane from wastewater could be used to heat city buildings or to fuel city or MTA fleets, greatly reducing greenhouse gas emissions from those sources in keeping with the 80 by 50 sustainability goals. It could also be sold to generate revenue for the city, as recommended in a 2018 analysis by the Independent Budget Office. As Commissioner Rolardo noted, equipment to upgrade biogas is now being installed at Newtown Creek. Once completed, biomethane will be injected into National Grid's network for use in thousands of area homes. At Newtown Creek, commercial food waste is being added to the digesters, which increases biogas and biomethane production. Such co-digestion there and introduced at other facilities is a path towards the city's zero by 30 goal of reducing waste sent to landfills. Improving anaerobic digestion systems at the wastewater treatment plants offers multiple benefits and opportunities, improving odor control, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by capturing methane, and reducing solid waste to landfills. Upgrading the biogas captured by the digesters would provide a renewable source of clean energy that the city could turn into revenue or use itself. To help meet the goals of the legislation under discussion and achieve other sustainability goals, we encourage the committee to recognize the importance of upgrades to anaerobic digestion infrastructure at our wastewater plants and to evaluate the increased production of biomethane from captured biogas. Thank you very much. I definitely appreciate both of your testimonies today, and uh, these are both, you know, both pieces of testimony have really good ideas that I think we need to explore more, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, so I'll be looking forward to working with you and with the administration uh, as we move forward on that. So thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So seeing no, no one else here to testify, I want to thank um, the members of the committee. I want to thank our legislative counsel, Samara Swanston. Thank you, Samara. Uh, Nadia Johnson, our senior policy analyst, Ricky uh, Chawla, our policy analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, our senior finance analyst, uh, from my team, uh, Nick Wazowski, my legislative counsel, and my uh, communications director, Terrence Cullen. I uh, look forward to working with the administration of all these issues. Uh, and with that, I will gavel this committee of environmental protection closed. <laughs>